Hello and welcome to Homeowner Talk. My name is David Stone and I'm the president of Nevada Association Services. And this is my co-host, John Leach, who is a partner in the law firm of John Leach, Johnson, Song & Gruco. Uh, each episode, we'll be here to talk with you about important homeowner topics. Uh, we're here to provide you, hopefully, with useful information on a number of subjects. We also want to encourage you to interact with us and our guests each episode. So please visit our website at homeownertalktv.com and send us your questions. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can on the show and online. Many homeowners and homeowners associations are facing financial concerns and are extremely worried about being taken advantage of through deceptive practices. Uh, we've invited some experts in to share some resources and answer questions. And with us today is Craig Huntington, <coughs> president of Alliance Association Financial Services. Uh, Mike Myers, the fire chief from Las Vegas Fire and Rescue, who is in our community spotlight and Christina Fuentes, the Minority Ombudsman for the State of Nevada. First, we'd like to welcome Craig Huntington. Nice to see you, Craig. Nice to see you, Dave, and you too, John. Thanks for being here, Craig. Oh, well, it's a real pleasure. Tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and about your company. Well, um, I started in the uh, HOA management business about uh, 35 years ago with my own management company in Ventura, California. And uh, I sold it about 13 years ago and started this little banking program in Nevada uh, that I thought I'd just come to Nevada, start a little banking program, play golf for the rest of my life. And <laughs> it kind of grew into this huge banking program all across the country. So uh, we now bank homeowners associations all, all over the United States. We have a very specialty banking program. We're a division of Bank of Nevada. So for our local uh, HOAs and customers, we're the local bank. But we also do this on a national uh, basis. Excellent. You know, uh, in the banking industry, you're very familiar with some of the financial pressures and stresses that are impacting homeowners associations today. And I wonder if you could discuss with our viewers and give them some information about how homes and communities are being defaulting in their responsibilities, how that's impacting associations. Well, again, uh, John, as you know, I travel all over the country and we have management companies and homeowners associations that we bank from Florida to California. And um, Nevada is really pretty lucky, actually, because with the nine-month super, uh, super lean here, uh, our associations in Nevada aren't as in bad shape as some of the other associations around the country. You go to Florida, for example, and the homeowners association there are really, really struggling because they don't have the opportunity to collect back assessments. And with the banks forestalling the foreclosures for a long time, people stay in their units for a long, long time and don't get paid. And I've seen homeowners associations with 40 and 50 percent delinquencies, and that really, really hurts the ability of a homeowners association to pay their bills, to pay the water, to pay the gardener, to keep the pool open. Uh, again, we're very lucky here in Nevada because of the super lien. It helps alleviate a lot of that. But I guess implied in that is if we didn't have the super priority lien, if we were unable, and, and please keep in mind that you know, the, the idea behind the super priority lien isn't that we're getting paid as we go, it's that if there's a foreclosure down the road, then the association is going to be able to recoup a portion of the money, it's only a portion. But uh, I guess what you're saying is, but for that, we would be in the same situation as Florida and other, other states that, that don't allow for that. Oh, you're absolutely right, John. As you know, we do loans and whatnot around the, the country also. And Florida, Michigan, terrible problems with the collecting other assessments. And the associations are just, uh, they cannot meet their obligations. The Craig, the financial um, viability of an association really affects your ability to loan money to community associations. Is, do I understand that correctly? That's exactly right, David. Um, the number one thing we look at as a bank to loan money to a homeowners association is their delinquency. Can they collect their money? Because that's the only way they're going to pay the ba bank back is if they collect money from their homeowners. So we look at a homeowners association with less than 10% delinquency um, on their overall assessment. So if, if you have 100 homeowners and 11 of them aren't paying their assessments, we will not make you a loan. So what do you see as the practical benefit of the nine month super priority lien in your ability to loan to associations? And what would happen if the associations weren't able to utilize or have the benefit of a nine month super priority lien? How would you see that result with respect to your ability to loan money to associations? And what do you loan money to associations for? I mean, maybe that's an important question. Well, that is, why bother? That is, because especially in today's environment, you have a lot of, you have some homeowner associations coming to us and wanting to borrow money to pay the water bill. 
you know, to pay monthly expenses, which we will not do. If they cannot collect enough money to pay the monthly bills, we're sure not going to loan them money. I hate to say it, but we're not the federal government. We can't print it, or they can't print it. But a lot of associations will fix the roof or a, a large siding project, high rises, need elevators. Sometimes there may be a construction defect case and they need to fix the roof before the case gets settled, those type of things. And so we, um, those are how we make the loans typically. Let's talk, there's a couple of subjects I really want you to get into before we lose you. And one of them is on fraud. You, you were educating us a little bit offset on some of the problems associations are having with fraud, whether it be the ACH or the uh, wire fraud and things like that. Could you please educate our viewers on yes, some of that? Yes, um, we see more and more fraud in the HOA world now, John, especially with wires and, a and ACH in the HOA world. Um, what happens, all management companies and most all HOAs allow their, uh, their, their homeowners to pay with an ACH, pay their assessments. You know, homeowner signs up, takes take the $80 out of my checking account every month. So the management company or the homeowners association builds a file once a month. They get all the information out of their computer and they send us that file and they say, oh, take this money from all these people that owe us money. Well, what we're seeing more and more is, is uh, fraudulent criminals getting into the software of a management company or homeowners association, copying the keystrokes and doing their own ACHs or jumping on the back of that ACHs. We've seen that here in Nevada, here in Las Vegas, where a management company had had a, uh, a fraudulent attacker copy their keystrokes and then went in and did an ACH, actually piggyed back off the ACH they sent and just added more and took an association for about $20,000. We see that and we see a lot of wire fraud, actually. We've basically stopped doing wire. Um, again, if you want to do a wire as an individual, you can walk in the bank. The bank knows who you are, your signature. Kind of an association with the, the management company involved and five or six board members. There's a lot of kind of gray area about there about who's the signers and not, what not. And, a, fr and an, a wire, once it's gone, it's gone. There's no getting that wire back. So we've almost stopped doing wires. So boards need to be very vigilant with their management companies and making sure that the funds are being protected. And, and it's, I appreciate very much that the bank is aware of that. You know, I, I really want to end on a positive note because <laughs> sure. Craig, one thing about Craig, you can't be around him long without feeling really good about what's going on. So Craig, could you, uh, you know, I know on your blog you talk about the importance of having a positive attitude. I know you've written a, little, a book I think that people should be aware of and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your travels and some of your experiences and I'm going to hold this up and hope the, the camera can zoom in on this. This is a book that Craig recently uh, published or wrote, Risk, A Road Worth Traveling. Craig, why don't you tell our viewers a little well, bit? Well, you know, you're right, John. And my next book, I think, is going to be on passion because I am a little passionate, as you know. You guys know me pretty well. Um, my book is about risk and how I think in the last 30 or 40 years we've lost the risk-taking ability um, in our country. You know, everybody wants to be uh, in a little bubble and want the government or somebody to take care of them. So um, my book's about risk and 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 reward. And if you take a risk, you get reward. And... and um, we have a lot of this now about you know people in the country wanting, 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 but they're not a, a, they're not willing to take the risk to to put themselves out. Both you guys are self-made men. You've both taken risks in your lives where you could have lost everything. I've done that multiple times in my well, life. With, with risk comes comes reward. So, Craig, thank you very much for joining us. And when we come back, we'll learn more about our brave firefighters, what they do to protect your home, and what resources are available to keep you safe. We'll be right back with our community spotlight. So, you're looking for help with your mortgage. Worried about foreclosure? We can help you keep your house. All we ask for in return is that you submit to our plans for galactic domination. <laughs> Sign. If you're facing foreclosure, talk to the right people. Speak with HUD-approved housing counselors free of charge at 888-995-HOPE. If you're a small business owner in search of affordable office space, the Urban Chamber of Commerce and the City of Las Vegas Redevelopment Agency have a great opportunity for you. You could become part of the Urban Chamber of Commerce Business Development Center, a 17,000 square foot facility offering flexible spaces that can be used for office or light industrial purposes. Just fill out an application. The forms are available at urbanchamber.org and lvrda.org or call the numbers on your screen for more information. 
Welcome back to Homeowner Talk. With us now as part of our community spotlight is the City of Las Vegas Fire Chief Mike Myers from Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. Thanks for being here with us, Chief. Thanks for having me. Would you tell our viewers just a little bit about yourself and how you got into fire? You know, it's spotlight. an interesting story. Uh, when I was uh, 17 years old, I uh, started with Las Vegas Fire Department at the time in their Explorer Post. And then uh, a few years later, about uh, two years later, I was 19 years old, I was actually a firefighter, uh, applied and was accepted in the fire department. And so I've spent most of my adult life living in fire stations here in Las Vegas. Um, last 10 years, I've been on now 25 years, so the last 10 years I've spent in administration as a, either assistant chief, a deputy chief, and then the last year as the fire chief. So it's been an interesting career for me. Well, you know, you got to understand from a, from a viewer's standpoint, you know, everyone sees a fire and they're running out. Yeah. And yeah. you guys are running in. Is that something that you have to teach yourself, train yourself to do that? Or how, how do you get these, these young men to, and women to be willing to do that? It's a good question. Um, so, you know, we, uh, it's hard to find uh, firefighters out there. So, you know, the firefighters, we go look for them. We're really trying to find uh, human beings that have extraordinary compassion for other human beings. Um, a lot of people don't know, you know, we run uh, 100,000 calls for service every year. And the bulk of those calls are humanitarian in nature just people that um, are at the lowest point of their lives having a very difficult situation. And we have these young men and women that we put badges on and ask them to go out there and, and do everything they can to help the human being. And uh, so we're really looking for very compassionate human beings. But on the same, uh, same token, I need to find individuals that have um, extreme courage as well. This is a high-risk occupation for these men and women. Uh, we put them in very dangerous atmospheres. Uh, we give them direct orders to do things that as you said, most people wouldn't think we're smart to do, and, and they don't second guess us and they go take care of it. And so to balance both a compassionate human being and someone that has that uh, courageous uh, mindset um, is difficult to find. And we think we have some of the finest firefighters in the country working for the city of Las Vegas. And, and you absolutely yeah. do, and we're all very fortunate. I'm curious, you said there are about 100,000 calls uh, a year. Is that the number that you used? Uh, yeah, about, no, I think we have about 90 something thousand calls okay. for service last year. Uh, and how does that compare to other cities of our size per capita? Are we pretty much on par with, uh, are we more needy, less needy for the, the help of, of the fire department? It's about the same uh, for cities that are our size that have the um, uh, tourist industry. So normal cities our size have a much smaller call volume, uh, but because of the tourist industry and, and the people, the, the numbers, the volume of people that we attract, our population base fluctuates, you know, during the week. So, um, you know, the weekends we can have, um, a, 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 you know, several 50,000 to 100,000 more people in a small confined area that we're responsible of, for taking care of. You mentioned driving down the strip on a Saturday night mm. in a fire truck. It's mm. bad enough in yeah. a night car, but <laughs> really? can you imagine what that would be like? Um, I, I know that the fire department does a great deal of trying to educate, train people and families. And I was wondering if you could tell our viewers just a little bit about the programs that the fire department offers for families and the free training and education that they offer. So uh, it's been interesting over the last few years we've watched this kind of uh, morph. Um, as the community has grown, um, we've tried to expand how we get free education out to the community. And we really had to partner with other community partners to make it happen. We have about 18,000 contacts for service every year between our firefighters, our public information office, and our fire, fire prevention office that goes out in the community and talks to kids and classes and, and different community groups. But we've had to uh, group up with like the uh, Southern Nevada Health District, the different hospitals in town for drowning prevention, um, the, the Heat Kills campaign for, for children locked in cars during the summer, uh, child uh, safety seats, uh, bike helmets, all those kinds of things that, that we go out to do as a fire department, we now do in cooperation with other community partners at different events. So um, as the community is looking for opportunities to learn about public safety, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's pool drowning or fire safety or any other uh, element of the community uh, where, where safety is an issue, look for those community opportunities to, uh, and we'll be there as the fire department. I know my kids get very excited when the, a, a fireman or woman comes to, mm -hmm. to their school um, what, what efforts are making, uh, officially, do you, do you make to reach out to, to kids? Because that leaves a lasting impression. I remember even when oh, I was a yeah, kid, there's... talking to the firemen and thinking that was the coolest thing ever. Yeah. What, what efforts do you, uh, do you do with respect to that? So we try not to turn anybody down. And it's, uh, some of it's even controversial. You know, I get a lot of requests uh, to help uh, charity groups. And we do everything we possibly can from pouring pancakes at cancer walks to hanging flags at 5Ks to whatever we can possibly do. If I can get a, a, an engine company there or a truck company there, uh, we try to get them there. 
every school request to read to the kids or to come in and tell them about fire safety or, or uh, emergency medical services and, and the work we do there. We try to do it. Um, so it's, it's a big part of our day. We, we really want these firefighters out in the community, in their neighborhoods, working closely with the children and the families that live in the community and talk to them regularly about fire safety. And so we uh, try not to turn down any request that comes in, but it is a, a, is a daunting task. And you made a reference a little earlier to um, drownings, pool drownings and whatnot, mm -hmm. and we're now about, about to enter that season again. And I, we can rest assured that there will be some pool drownings yeah. this year. Now, I had one incident in my life where I should have been prepared to perform CPR, working mm -hmm. at a hotel and a person drops with a mm -hmm. heart attack. Mm -hmm. But we know that there's going to be these type of situations. Is there something you can recommend to families about or where they can learn CPR so that they can be prepared? Because time is of the essence when, and when that happens. And waiting for the emergency to arrive, to is there something you can recommend to families about learning about CPR? Well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. So it, it does take a community to save a life. Um, the, the cardiac, the, uh, the survivability from an individual that goes into cardiac arrest, when their heart stops and they're, they're dead, the chances of them walking out of the hospital neurologically intact across this country is about 3 to 5%. It's pretty low. Wow. Uh, we happen to have a survivability rate when, we witn when somebody witnesses arrest and we show up on scene as the fire department, we have a, a survivability rate um, of 30% in the Las Vegas community, and that's wow. huge. But the reason that's so high is not just the training that the firefighters have, the equipment that we buy, um, how we respond, uh, the, 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 the quickness in how they get there, the quickness in how the dispatchers take the calls. A lot of that has to do with, is the bystander prepared to deliver CPR when the patient goes down? Whether it's a child in a drowning or in one of our you know, uh, family members uh, that has a cardiac arrest at home. Um, so it's very important that bystanders citizens of this community in your neighborhoods learn hands-on CPR. And it, it, no longer are we teaching from the fire department aspect all of the mouth-to-mouth -mouth respirations and we just couldn't get the entire community bought into the, the whole concept. And we've been teaching hands-only CPR, hands-only compressions. If you can circulate the blood around, it'll give us time to get there with the equipment and we've, sh and, and that we've had great success with that. So uh, be aware. Um, as, as in the community, we have regularly occurring events where we, we call it the uh, Save a Life program. And we go to many different fairs, festivals, um, schools, um, everywhere we can be. We bought mannequins for every fire engine so that these firefighters can teach Save a Life on the fly. Do you have a resource where someone can go to to get information on where, where you're going to be and, you know, if they have questions on CPR classes, where would, where would the... Uh, where would we go to find that? So a couple, a couple areas. Uh, first is uh, lasvegasnevada.gov is the city's website. We'll put that on our website also so people can access it. Yeah, and it's a great website for just city events in general. You know, there's all kinds of different activities going on. And we try to get to those city events also and have a booth there or have an engine company there, whether it's a, a movie in the park or whatever. We'll have an engine there with the mannequins to show people how to do compression-only CPR. We tried to ha hold events uh, so people would come to the CPR event and they were unsuccessful. So instead, we found that there's already these great city events and, and events going on throughout our communities already. Let's go to them. It doesn't take much to bring an engine company down there. We already have four people on that engine company and teach that uh, hands-free CPR at those events. So it's likely if you find those city events, we'll be there. In our, in our last moments with you, Chief, could you maybe tell our viewers uh, the th kind of things that they should avoid the mistakes that you see people make mm -hmm. that they should avoid when it comes to uh, safety, fire prevention, these types of things? Well, unfortunately, um, the, the largest, the majority of our fires are residential. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're really focused on trying to keep the fire death rate down within the community. Uh, uh, but the fact is that if there's a fire death, it's likely to occur in a residence. And it's likely to have been preventable just like drownings and, and those kinds of things. So uh, we really want to focus on um, cooking and, and kind of focusing on uh, make, you know, being aware of what you're doing when you're cooking, don't leave things unattended, careless smoking, candles, those kinds of mistakes can end in tragedy and, and really cause uh, a lot of difficulty for the homeowner. Okay, great. Well, Chief Myers, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. That was very, uh, very helpful information that we can all use. Um, please refer to our website for additional guidance that the fire department provided to us. And I hope these community spotlights, uh, spotlights help our viewers. Uh, on a recent episode, we featured an award-winning organization called Foreclosed Upon Pets. 
Shortly after the episode aired, our executive producer, Andrea, uh, spotted an abandoned dog at a neighborhood playground and got foreclosed upon pets involved. She also got the word out through Facebook that the dog needed a home. The story has a great ending. Uh, one of Andrea's friends adopted the dog, and here's a photo of Dolce, cute little white dog. Um, Dolce now lives with the Harris family. That, that's an incredible story. You know, you know, to refer back to our main topic of fraud and finances, we have a special guest, Christina Fuentes, who is the state of Nevada's minority ombudsman. She has, is a direct contact for minorities who have fallen victim to fraud and deceptive practices. Our executive producer, Andrea Behrens, sat down with Christina to learn more about what she does. Let's take a look. Thank you for joining us today, Christina. What do you do as an ombudsman for minority affairs? As the Ombudsman for Minority Affairs, I assist consumers with any fraud or deceptive trade issues, um, especially I focus on all of the divisions within the Department of Business and Industry. We understand there can be issues in neighborhoods when minority residents are not familiar with contracts and banking systems as well as other services. How do you handle that? The majority of the consumers that I deal with are uh, Hispanics and the issue with that is the language barrier. They either don't read the language or understand the language or they don't speak the language and so that poses a problem when they are um, going to be signing documents or reviewing documents that obviously they don't understand. And so I assist them with uh, maybe reviewing some documents if they are in that process or um, otherwise I assist them with filing complaints um, in, the, in English uh, because they don't either read or write or understand the English language. So if they have contracts and documents, do you assist them in going over them before they sign them to prevent complaints later? I, I could do that um, if, that, if that's what they are, are needing. However, unfortunately, most of the time, um, they have already signed the document, and it's usually too late for us to, to help them prevent any fraud. It's after the fact that I usually come into the picture what sort of common scams and issues are you seeing in communi communities across the state that sometimes minorities fall victim to? Um, the most prevalent scam right now is the loan modification companies that are um, scamming homeowners um, that are in distress uh, with, you know, telling them that they can, they can assist them, you know, fix their loans, uh, repair their loans, change their principal amount that they owe, change their payment. I mean, they give them a variety of stuff that they can do for them and they even guarantee it. And so these people fall victim to, you know, the fact that these, this company can help them and assist them in, in, in getting them out of the situation that they're in. And since the homeowner doesn't understand uh, a lot of the documents they're signing, they trust this company because there's that cultural um, relation, that's, that language relation, you know, it's the affinity to the, the company and that company preys on them and they use that tactic to prey on them. And, you know, the, unfortunately the, the homeowners sign documents, sign away their lives to these companies and in, in all, you know, and also they, they, get, they give them lots and lots of money that they could be using towards their mortgage. How would a homeowner or somebody find you and know that you're able to help them with these scams or help them with complaints that they might have? Uh, currently, I'm making a huge effort within the community to reach out to different minority groups, not only Hispanic, but African American Asian and Asian because I am the minority affairs ombudsman, so that encompasses all minorities. Um, I'm doing a huge push in the community to get the word out there. I'm going to as many community events as I can. I'm going. I'm meeting with as many community focus groups as I can. Um, I'm doing as much media as I can, especially in the different communities. Um, and that effort hopefully will help and put out the word that I'm here to assist them um, and you know, let them know that there's somebody here to help. And my thing is, is if I can't help them directly, then I can help find them a resource that can help them. And so I'm building that you know, kind of bridging that gap with, with those resource organizations that can assist them so that I can just refer somebody right over to them and, and they can help them with, with their situations. What if a community association or a board of directors has a, um, an issue with a homeowner or the homeowner has an issue with the association? How, do you get involved? Do you help? 
Um, I can refer them over to our real estate division, which has a, 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 a um, department that deals with HOAs. They have a, an investigator that is bilingual that can help them um, you know, with their issue with their HOA or with their board um, of the HOA. And I know there's a fine line with those things, and so that's why I refer them over there because I don't specialize in HOAs or you know, the, the, the board stuff. So if I refer them over there and they can be easily helped you know, even if they have a language barrier. Great. Well, thank you very much, Christina. This was very informative. We appreciate you coming on to Home on Our Talk. You're welcome. Thank you. We would like to thank Christina for some very important information about how to protect minority interests and guard against fraud and abuse. We're glad we had the chance to get her input. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. Please stay with us. life's this hard, graduating can be even harder. But you can help Ativa and the students in your community make it through by visiting BoostUp.org. Are you upside down on your mortgage? You're not alone. Good advice shouldn't cost. Don't pay for what should be free. Call Free Homemade Nevada at 229-HOME or visit FreeHomemadeNevada.org. Welcome back to Homeowner Talk. And before we leave, it's time for the viewer question, which comes from Ronald. He asks, if a bank owns the property due to a foreclosure, are they responsible for paying the assessments? And how is it handled? David, uh, what would be your answer to that question? Well, it's a fantastic question. Um, and we could spend three hours talking about it, but I'm not going to, to do Good, that You've got about a minute. <laughs> got a minute. Um, when the bank forecloses on the piece of property, um, whoever ends up owning the property as a result of that foreclosure sale, whether it's the bank or a third party buyer, they are responsible for assessments from the day they take title to that property. And what I found in dealing with my clients anyway is that a lot of board members still are not aware that an associate, that a, a bank is no different than any other homeowner. They have to make payments to their homeowners, to the homeowners association. Uh, they're also responsible for a nine month super priority lien. So when the bank forecloses, there is a nine month super priority lien that they are also responsible to pay for, whether it's the bank or whoever ends up owning the property at the foreclosure sale. After that point, a bank or a third party buyer at the foreclosure sale is no different than any other, any of us human beings that live in, the, in, our, in our homes. They have to pay their assessments on time. And if they don't pay their assessments on time, they are subject to the, the uh, collection process as prescribed in the association's governing documents uh, and in the statute. So a bank is no, no different than anybody else. Excellent, and they do have money is what I hear. Anyway, a little bit. David, I'd like to thank you very much for your in insight on that very important question. And we'd like to thank our guests today, Craig Huntington, Chief Mike Myers, and Christina Fuentes. That's all for this edition of Homeowner Talk. We'd also like to thank our partners on the show, HOA Management, Alliance Association Financial Services, Classic Landscapes, LLC, GetDocsNow.com, Western Risk Insurance, and Nevada Association Services. Remember, you can always find information about this program, and you can also drop us a line at homeownertalktv.com. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time right here on Homeowner Talk.